The speaker for this presentation is Mitra Nadim. Hi, I'm Mitra Nadim from the University of Southern California. I'd like to thank Dr. Mehta and the organizing committee for inviting me again this year to give a talk at the CRT meeting. Today, I'm going to be talking about recognizing and treating hepatorenal syndrome. What's the plan? It's my disclosures. So if we look at the epidemiology of uh, acute kidney injury in patients with liver disease over the past two decades, there's been an increase of hospitalizations of patients with acute kidney injury um, starting 15% back in 2004, now as high as 29%. And a lot of this um, increase could be potentially due to the changing definition of um, acute kidney injury uh, in these patients. Prior to 2010, there was no definition for AKI in patients with liver disease, and the definition was basically only on hepatorenal syndrome, which was developed by the International Club of Ascites um, in 1996. At, in 2010, ATKI had a consensus meeting in uh, collaboration with the International Club of Societies, whereby um, AKI was defined in this cohort of patients, and it was later on adopted um, in 2015, again, by the International Club. And what ATKI had proposed back in 2010 was to use, at that time, the Aiken criteria um, existed. KDGO was not out. And basically, it was using the AKI serum creatinine definition, which was an increase of 50% of the serum creatinine from baseline, or an increase of 0.3 milligram to define AKI in this group. And what um, we had suggested also is that HRS type 1 to be a specific form of acute kidney injury. The urine output criteria at this time was not included as there was no data at this time. We also put forth this uh, notion which we called hepatorenal disorders. And what, it's, what we suggested was that patients um, with liver disease can have underlying chronic kidney disease. And these patients then can develop a, either acute kidney injury, HRS type 1 or type 2. And these can then later on, these patients can go on to develop type 1 HRS or AKI. And there's also patients, again, who have no kidney disease, but they can develop any of these um, uh, kidney injuries, either HRS1, 2, or AKI. And over time, this HRS2 could potentially lead to chronic kidney disease. In 2015, the International Club of Ascites um, took the ATKI uh, recommendations and updated it with the KDGO uh, definition, again, only for the serum creatinine. They also included a definition for the baseline serum creatinine that if it was not available, what to consider as a baseline in a patient with liver disease. The urine output criteria, however, was not included in their definition and it was um, felt by um, the uh, group that these patients um, are often oliguric, that they're often on diuretics, that the collection may not be accurate. And therefore, um, there was, again, um, no data to support the use of urine output as a criteria. Subsequently, um, Dr. Kellum in his group in Pittsburgh did a very nice retrospective analysis of um, close to 3,000 patients with liver disease in eight ICUs. And using the KDGO serum creatinine and urine output criteria, what they showed was that patients who had no kidney injury but met urine output criteria for stage um, one, two, or three um, had a higher mortality, at least uh, with stage three urine output criteria, compared to a patient who had serum creatinine criteria for AKI, but no urine output criteria. And if they met both criteria for stage three, their mortality was quite high at 48%. So very similar data that he has also shown in non serotic patients. The International Societies Club also, because of um, now recognizing and um, defining acute kidney injury, they redefined hepatorenal syndrome and they removed the criteria of serum creatinine of 1.5 cutoff. And instead, they included the diagnosis um, based on, again, the KDGO criteria for AKI. They kept the um, notion that no macroscopic um, evidence of structural injury should be um, 
evident in these patients. However, they did add a note that these patients who fulfill these criteria may still have structural damage, such as tubular damage. And so this goes back to the notion of what um, the ATKI group had come up, um, had suggested that these patients can have underlying chronic kidney disease. And on top of that, they develop um, hepatorenal syndrome. This now has been um, set forth um, by myself and um, Dr. Angeli, um, Dr. Garcia, and uh, Prick as, a, as whether or not um, to take this one step further and to remove this, um, def this kind of HRS1 to classification and now to move towards um, HRS1 to be called HRS1. AKI, and the criteria would be the KDGO criteria of not only serum creatinine criteria for defining AKI, but also the urine output criteria, and the HRS2 now to be subdivided um, into AKD and CKD, depending on whether or not the kidney injury is um, less than three months time period, and, and whereby this would be called acute kidney uh, disease, and to get rid of this terminology of HRS2. So one thing to keep in mind is that even though we focus on hepatorenal syndrome, we need to keep in mind that not all kidney and um, liver disease is due to HRS. Like every patient, we have to go through the whole full workup, whether these are pre-renal, renal, or post-renal causes for renal, um, ca pre-renal cases um, to uh, once we have excluded volume depletion, it comes down to whether the patient is ATN or hepatorenal syndrome. And this can be very difficult at times. It's a diagnosis of exclusion we talk about, and it's not straightforward. And it's important because the treatment of these two is um, completely different. And so um, when we think about trying to differentiate it, it can sometimes become very confusing for the um, treating physician. And why is it confusing? Because there's no data to, help, there's no um, way that we can very accurately, short of a kidney biopsy of diagnosing HRS or hepatitis. Um, ATN. There's been studies looking at kidney biopsies, comparing that with urine indices, um, and there has been no good correlation found between that. Um, investigators are, have been looking at biomarkers, especially NGAL, and this was from the um, uh, Yale group, the Tribe AKI Consortium. And you can see here that NGAL was able to differentiate between pre-renal, hepatorenal, and ATN. However, there was quite a lot of overlap between the three groups. But what is also interesting that I wanted to um, bring your attention to was the fact that the fraction excretion of sodium was less than 1% for all three. Keep in mind that none of this, um, none of these studies or other biomarker studies are based on kidney biopsy, is based on clinically how physicians have diagnosed HRS or ATN or pre-renal and then looking at biomarkers. But again, these injury of biomarker, even though they were helpful, there was um, quite a bit of overlap. Um, this is a study looking at the fraction excretion of urea. Again, the same thing that with HRS and, and um, pre-renal state, they are both low, but patients with hepatorenal tend to be extremely um, low with the um, FE urea. The same with the fraction excretion of sodium where the HRS group and, um, was the lowest of all patients. This is the most recent by um, uh, Paraginis' um, group and um uh, Barcelona, where they um, looked at NGAL in patients who presented with AKI at day one and day um, three. And NGAL, compared to the other um, biomarkers, it performed the best at a cutoff point of 220. Again, quite a lot of overlap between the HRS patient ATN, but it was, um, it performed quite well. Again, as I mentioned, we need to keep in mind other causes of liver disease, uh, kidney disease in these patients with liver disease. They can have a lot of glomerular diseases with um, uh, various liver conditions. They can present with acute tubular necrosis. Now with bile acid nephropathy is becoming something that is discussed quite a bit these days, um, interstitial nephritis. But there's also systemic diseases like diabetes, shock, sarcoidosis, amyloid, sickle cell. They can all have not only liver but kidney involvement. It's something, again, to keep in mind when we evaluate these patients. What about treatment? This is um, a very nice quote by Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And our 
focus initially should be trying to prevent these patients from developing acute kidney injury or developing hepatorenal syndrome. And there's a lot of preventive strategies that I'm not going to go into, but the overall is albumin infusion, avoiding um, too much diuretics, avoiding dehydration, looking at the medication so that they're not nephrotoxic, radio contrast, minimizing radio contrast exposure in a patient who is who already has um, um, risk factors, and again, keeping the um, uh, hemodynamics uh, stable. What about um, treatment of these patients? Um, Terlipressin has been studied both in uh, Europe and um, in the U.S. There's been two um, large randomized control studies in the U.S., which were both, um, they didn't meet their primary endpoint. The third study came out as a late breaking in 2019, has not been published. And this was the first um, study in the U.S. whereby um, there was a positive um, uh, result on their, their primary endpoint where trilopressin performed much better. It performed better in patients, especially if their serum creatinine was less than five. The problem was that the patients with trilopressin, they had more adverse um, events, include, uh, mainly respiratory failure, and death within uh, 90 days due to respiratory disorder was higher in the trilopressin group. So if they fail medication, what about um, dialysis? Most of us have always taken this idea of if they're um, transplant candidate, then we should offer everything. If not, they should undergo palliative care. But studies are showing, well, that's not the case. The thought has always been that hepatorenal patients have a poor outcome, but it's the same with any patient who is not listed for, who is not a liver transplant candidate whether it's um, hepatorenal or ATN, their prognosis is quite poor, but it's very similar. So to not offer dialysis in a patient that we think has hepatorenal syndrome, again, but offering it to the other patient is not really the right decision in this patient population. And in fact, studies are showing more and more that if patients present with um, ACLF um, regardless of ACLF grading one, two, three, so they can be very, very sick on admission. But by day three or seven, if they have improvement in their um, ACLF grading and they're now down to ACLF one, you can see their 30 day mortality is 0% <coughs> in exchange. Um, the the um, contrast to that is if they present with an ACLF one, but within a week, they develop ACLF3, so multi-organ failure. You can see their survival is quite poor. But if they do get to transplant, these patients do quite well. If they have hepatorenal syndrome, their outcome, their renal outcome and survival outcome is no different from those who have acute kidney injury, regardless of how long they've been on dialysis. But patients who have acute tubular necrosis tend to do much poorly post-transplant. So this is um, a multidisciplinary a recommendation is that should you decide to start renal replacement therapy, it should be based on clinical grounds, worsening AKI, worsening volume overload, despite diuretic therapy, worsening, um, not responding to medical management. And renal replacement should be considered even if they're a non-oliguric, if you cannot reach the daily fluid balance that is necessary to keep them negative. Thank you for your attention.